and welcome. So uh, my name is Chloe McMurray. If you don't know who I am, I work for the Tennessee Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence. I'm a program specialist, and I'm also the chair for the Inclusivity Committee, which is just a task force dedicated to education and working towards getting the best resources to underserved populations. Regina is on the committee with us, and I'm going to introduce her so she can get started on our training today. So <clears throat> Regina earned her bachelor's degree in psychology and her master's in clinical mental health counseling, both from the University of Memphis. Um, during her graduate program, she worked with one of the university's research departments, the Center for Research on Women, which is CROW for short. Here, she assisted with two studies, one which was on looking into US colleges ease of access in locating Title IX resources and policies. She became interested in Title IX and saw that there was ineffectiveness across the country in making sure students had access to this topic. So during her internship and job following graduation, she counseled victims and survivors of domestic violence and child sexual abuse. She felt called to go back to research and obtained a research examiner position for the CANDLE study at the University of Tennessee Health Science Center, which was a longitudinal study on childhood development. Title IX had been on her brain the whole time, and she was alerted by a friend to the opening of her current position as the Title IX Prevention Specialist. In her current role, she provides education and trainings to faculty, staff, and students at her alma mater in interpersonal violence prevention and awareness. So without anything further, take it away, Regina. Okay, great. <clears throat> so hi, everyone. Like Chloe said, my name is Regina Bartkoven, and I'm the Title IX Prevention Specialist at the University of Memphis. So this presentation is a general overview of different laws regarding rape and sexual assault throughout history, as well as some of the recent and current movements, um, you know, in the last hundred years or so. So first and foremost, I always like to give a content warning of sorts um, or a trigger warning. So this presentation does discuss sexual assault, obviously, and interpersonal violence. There is also instances of racism in the, throughout this presentation. Um, also, terms will be used as they were written at the time, um, which might feel a little uncomfortable. In general, it was very uncomfortable researching this material, and so it might be uncomfortable to hear as well. Um, so finally, this presentation does not really have a happy ending because there is still a lot of work to be done. Um, so please take care of yourself. If you need to walk away for a bit or even leave the presentation entirely, I'm not going to be offended. Self-care comes first. And also a major disclaimer. Many voices have been silenced throughout history concerning their experiences with sexual violence. This especially includes the voices of women of color, the LGBTQ plus community and other underserved populations. While some of these policies and movements do include these populations, I highly encourage everyone on the call today to look into issues facing communities outside of your own that you may not be a part of and seeing how you can assist them. So to get started, I kind of want to talk a bit about why I chose this topic to present on in the first place. Uh, since I was young, I've had an interest in somewhat uh, morbid history and literature, and I'm pretty sure I'm not alone in that. But for my personal reasons, I blame my parents for this uh, because I wasn't allowed to watch rated R movies because I grew up in a strict Catholic household. But for some reason, they allowed me to read whatever I wanted. So of course, I gravitated towards the uh, controversial side of the school library. Um, later in college, you know, I received my bachelor's in psychology and um, I took classes like the psychology of evil, which yes, was a real class, probably still is. Um, and during my master's program um, and into the earlier part of my career, um, I counseled survivors and or in victims or witnesses of sexual and domestic violence. So everyone in my program and also my colleagues early in my career, we all had to research, have a lot of understanding and have a lot of empathy. Um, so we all knew about like the disturbing statistics and trends. And after some time as a counselor, switched career paths, got into research again, where I worked with moms and children on cognitive, physical and behavioral development. And even though I saw already, knew already that trauma is generational, is passed down, um, it was different seeing it impacting like family units, which I had not seen before. I usually work with individuals. 
Um, <clears throat> and now that I'm at back at the University of Memphis, I've learned that there are even more systemic issues regarding sexual assault from a policy and education standpoint. So that all being said, I am absolutely have the belief that unless we know and understand the history behind things, we are doomed to repeat it. So I'm hoping that by giving this brief overview, it will help others see how much change is still needed and I don't know, maybe even be a call to action of sorts. So first I'll be going over different time periods regarding laws and policies. I believe that these laws have contributed a lot to the culture surrounding rape and sexual assault today. And to note, there is an absence of laws regarding sexual assault in the LGBTQ plus community. And that is unfortunately because for thousands of years in many places, um, and even now, um, can even consensual sexual relationships between same sex individuals uh, were punished. So you'll also probably notice that many of these policies are and laws are women centered and more than likely that's just because societies did not believe that men uh, or male identifying people could be raped. Starting off with ancient history. Some of the earliest known laws regarding rape are from Hammurabi's code in Babylon around the late 1700s BCE. Um, rape was seen as property damage against a woman's father, assuming that she was a virgin. So if the rape occurred against a virgin, it was punishable by death um, and the virgin would remain blameless. However, if the rape was against a married woman, it was considered adultery and both uh, parties would be sentenced to death. Um, however, there were some rules around this. The um, wife's husband could attempt to rescue her during the execution process and the king also had power to excuse the rapist. In the Assyrian Empire from about 2025 BCE to 1400 BCE, they had an eye for an eye mentality, um, but in the worst way possible. Um, so for example, if a man's wife was raped, the husband could go and rape the perpetrator's wife. So the rapist wasn't really punished, just the women in the situation were. The ancient Hebrews, estimated somewhere between 1000 BCE to 70 CE, so common era, um, had various punishments based on like where the assault took place and whether the victim was a virgin, betrothed, or married. So generally, it resulted <clears throat> in the death for one or both parties. This was especially true if the victim didn't attempt to fight or call for help. The Greeks um, around 700 BC uh, had lesser punishment in the forms of fines. Um, they were also the only one I found out of all of these that did recognize male victims of sexual assault as well. And then the Celts uh, between 1200 BCE to 40 CE had somewhat, I don't want to call them progressive laws because they're not progressive, but in comparison to the others, they were they at least recognize different types of sexual assault, uh, such as forcible and violent versus incapacitation. So if someone were asleep or passed out or something. Um, however, in order for it to be considered an assault, the victim had to cry for help and report it immediately. And then Rome, at some point between the eighth century BCE and 476 uh, common era, they referred to rape as abduction and not necessarily assault. However, that did evolve. And so when it actually did count as that, um, rape towards a married woman was a crime against the husband. But if it happened to an unmarried woman, widow or nun, it was actually a crime against them. So it was kind of the first time that they were seen as their own autonomous being. However, um, prostitutes or sex workers were not protected under these laws. So these types of laws continued um, throughout time. And when we hit like the, around the 17th century or so, we start to see a little bit more nuance. Um, so during the Incan empire um, around 1400 CE, rape was punishable, punishable by death if it were against a virgin, a woman of higher status, or if it was a repeated offense. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to find like what they considered to be assault. During the Qing Dynasty, a code was released in 1646 regarding criminal offenses, and they purposefully made it difficult to prove that a rape occurred. Um, women had to show bruises, they had to prove that they fought throughout the whole ordeal, and they had to show torn clothing. Essentially, the dynasty was trying to eliminate false allegations. This may sound a little familiar. Um, 
And then when the early colonizers came to America and established themselves, they defined rape as the carnal knowledge of a woman 10 years or older, forcibly and against her will. So that brings us to the period of time of recognized slavery and afterwards during Jim Crow. It was legal or at the very least eyes were averted um, for those enslaved to be sexually abused because they were considered property. This included both men and women. Um, after slavery supposedly ended, uh, black women were and still are assaulted on a larger scale than white women. And really the only time that white people during this time, especially men, seem to care about sexual assault is when a black man was accused of harassing white women. Suddenly there'd be an uproar and lynchings would take place with no trial, or even if there was a trial, it would be a very biased one. A horrific example of this was in the case of Emmett Till, who was killed with no trial in 1955 after being accused of harassing a white woman. Um, the two men who killed him were not found guilty, and because of je double jeopardy laws, they actually did confess in 1956 because they knew they wanted to be punished for it. Decades later, the woman in question is rumored to have recanted much of her testimony and say that it was um, exaggerated, but this has not been fully confirmed and is disputed by a relative of hers. So marital rape is something that's still an issue today, um, but for the longest time, society did not even recognize that sexual assault could occur in a marriage. It was just something that was expected. Um, I highly recommend reading The Women's Room by Marilyn Finch uh, for a look into this. Um, it's an account of you know, housewives during the 50s and 60s and their experiences with this. And from what, from what I have been told and from what I understand, it is a very accurate representation and a very interesting read. But anyways, through education, people have begun to realize that consent is still needed in marriage, um, but there are still certain religious groups and cultural groups that still expect sex to occur even if one of the partners has not consented. So all 50 states made it against the law in some way, shape or form by 1993. Um, I was five at the time, so not too long ago. Um, however, there are still um, exceptions made depending on the severity. So for example, in some states, if there is no evidence of violence, such as bruising, it may not be recognized. And then other countries that still allow marital rape include Ghana, India, Indonesia, Jordan, Lesotho, Nigeria, Oman, Singapore, Sri Lanka and Tanzania. I want everyone to keep in mind that in some of these countries, including 46 states of ours, allow child marriage. So considering the age of consent, this is by default rape, although it is not considered as such in the communities where this is acceptable. So let's consider like today's perceptions of rape for a moment. There are many myths or misconceptions surrounding sexual assaults. So we see in Hammurabi's code that married women who are raped were charged with adultery instead. There are still too many people to this day who believe that married women cannot be raped. Um, in Rome, sex workers were excluded from the protection of laws. This corresponds with the myth that rape is okay if she deserved it by being promiscuous. The Greeks were the only one of these to acknowledge that rape can happen to anyone, and a common misconception even now is that men cannot be sexually assaulted, especially if the perpetrator is female identifying. Many of these societies had strict laws where you had to give proof um, for it to be considered assault. Um, so for example, today, if someone comes out and reports assault years after it happened, um, people will say that if she didn't fight or report immediately, it wasn't rape or that she made it up. A very harmful and very untrue stereotype is that Black women are more promiscuous than others. Another harmful one is that Black men are seen as more aggressive. This stems from the lie that white men use to justify sexually assaulting Black women and killing Black men during slavery in the Jim Crow era and even during today. And during the Qing Dynasty, they were trying to avoid false allegations of assault. This is still present today with the harmful misconceptions that most allegations of sexual assault are false when research has shown time and time again that that is not true. All of these misconceptions that we have today are literally millennia in the making, showing why it is so difficult to change the culture surrounding sexual violence. 
And so now that we've gone over a wonderfully very bleak history, um, I want to give credit to the people who sparked movements or even solo instances in the fight against sexual violence. So with this first one, the Memphis riots of 1866 is, not, is an event that I had never heard of um, up until a couple of months ago when I was researching people to post about during Black History Month. So in 1866, a year after the Civil War ended, a group of Black residents gathered in South Memphis and police attempted to break up the group for some reason. Gunshots were fired. Um, the details surrounding this are pretty murky. Not really sure who started what on this, but no matter whatever the reason, riots then ensued. Um, so white male terrorists targeted Black communities. They burned down buildings, they murdered, and they raped members of said communities. A transgender Black woman by the name of Frances Thompson, who was formerly enslaved, was one of the women sexually assaulted during these riots. She and some of the other survivors actually went before Congress, like United States Congress, not like the state one, um, to give their accounts of the assaults. And she is believed to be the first transgender woman to testify before Congress. These types of testimonies were not very common in the first place. So this was a really big deal. Unfortunately, but not surprisingly, there were no major punishments given to those who were actually found guilty. And unfortunately as well, 10 years later, she was outed as transgender and this information was used to discredit her story. She was sentenced to the city's chain gang as punishment for being transgender and she did not receive justice. But again, she must be credited with the steps that she took to fight against this type of violence, even though she probably knew that it wasn't going to result in anything. So moving on to the suffragist, the suffragist movement in the United States, when we think about this, we mostly think about the women's right to vote. Um, however, over the course of five generations, there were multiple issues that these women were concerned with. Um, and one thing I want to mention is that this movement as a whole excluded women of color. While there were some suffragettes, um, including like the founders, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, they were considered abolitionist and inclusive, but many of our main characters, um, for example, Susan B. Anthony, were not. An example of this would be with Ida B. Wells pictured here. She was ostracized from the movement due to her focus on lynchings and civil rights in addition to women's suffrage. Um, she did go on later to have many accomplishments in her lifetime, especially here in Memphis. So the movement officially began in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention attended by 300 people. And during this convention, women listed the inequalities that they suffered. Um, this included like no voice in lawmaking, not having independent rights after marriage, no custody of children in case of divorce, no right to a college education, no opportunity to enter most professions, and of course, no right to vote. And while none of these outright or yeah, outright lay out sexual assault, these gender norms do contribute to sexual violence. So I still think they're important to bring up. There was another movement going on around this time too, the social purity movement, and it was led by evangelicals. This was interesting to say the least. Um, one of the things this movement got right was that they were able to raise the age of consent. So at the time consent raged ranged between, or the age of consent range, ranged between seven to 10 years old. Um, and they were able to get it to 14 to 18 years old, depending on the state. So this was a pretty big change. And as you can imagine, not many people were happy about it. They also took on like kind of the individual micro level of talking to good Christian men and attempting to convince them to be respectful towards women and dismantling the hypocrisy and sexual standards. So even though they were evangelical, many um, liberal feminists were happy with this uh, movement because they were concerned about sexual violence being used against them during their activism. However, there was a third group who also liked what the social purity movement was doing, and that was people who were okay with eugenics. So the social purity movement's driving factor was to make sure that white women didn't succumb to prostitution because they wanted to maintain white purity. So it was this really weird Venn diagram um, for all three of these groups, which was super problematic. In 1910, the movement came to fruition with the passing of the Mann Act, um, also known as the White Slave Traffic Act 
which made it a felony for men to transport white women across state lines for immoral purposes. Since then, the Mann Act has been amended and still in effect today, but um, they have changed the wording because it was really ambiguous. And what was happening is that um, consensual relationships, maybe in the form of adultery, um, those people were getting charged with this, um, with this felony. Um, and also another issue was that they were using it as an excuse to punish interracial relationships as well. So now it is much more defined and specific and it includes all persons. Um, it includes child pornography and sex trafficking and it is gender neutral now. So Rosa Parks, when we all learned about Rosa Parks in school, at least at my school, the most common teaching was that she was this sweet older lady who was too tired after a long day of work and didn't wanna to go to the back of the bus. Um, some of us may now know that she was working with the NAACP that whole time, and it was a event created by them to um, spark this societal change. But there is a lot more to her story. So in 1944, a young woman by the name of Reese Taylor was walking home from a church revival in Abbeville, Alabama, when a group of seven white men abducted and raped her. When the NAACP found out what happened, they sent Rosa um, to find out what had occurred. Um, after Parks had finished with the interview and everything, she went back to Montgomery where she founded the Alabama Committee for Equal Justice um, in order to help Reese Taylor get the justice that she deserved. And even though Taylor reported the crime, witnesses confirmed her story, and one of the men even confessed and named the other perpetrators, none of them were ever arrested after an intense legal battle. To put this timeline in perspective, um, this is on the slide, this is Reese Taylor at the age of 97 in 2017. Um, I believe she did pass away in 2017, but this was only four years ago. This happened a lot re more recently than people realize. And a documentary um, came out in 2017 where she was interviewed about the event and legal battle. Abbeville, Alabama has since issued an official apology, but obviously this does not equal, to equal justice. So with second wave woman, uh, feminism and womanism, um, second wave feminism began with the release of the feminine mystique, which discussed the systemic sexism that taught women that their place was in the home and that if they were unhappy as housewives, it was only because they were broken and perverse. So this book sold 3 million copies in three years. And I mentioned womanism in here too. There is a slight difference between the two. Womanism was a little bit of a breakaway. So while second wave feminism was a little bit more inclusive than the original suffragette movement, um, there were some differences in priorities between white women and black women. White women focused more on being able to work outside the home, reproductive rights, access to contraception, things like that. And all of these were important to Black women as well, but one, many Black women were already working outside the home, so that wasn't something that they were as concerned with. And two, they also not only put a focus on reproductive rights, but also wanted to stop the forced sterilization of people of color and people with disabilities. So for the purposes here, I'm only including landmark wins specifically for sexual assault. Um, feminists worked to outlaw marital rape, which we started seeing in the 1970s. They also raised awareness about domestic violence, sexual harassment in the workplace, and building shelters for women escaping from rape and domestic violence. And the first rape crisis center was founded in San Francisco in 1971. And a big one was Title IX. <laughs> So Title IX was enacted in 1972 as part of the education amendments. Um, and it was originally addressed towards female athletes, but it's evolved, so I'm gonna get into that in just a second. But it was enacted to address the inequalities for female athletes. Before Title IX, few opportunities existed for them. The NCAA was created in 1906 to format and enforce rules in men's football, but had become the ruling body of college athletics. Um, they didn't offer any athletic scholarships to women, and they also held no championships for their teams. So furthermore, facilities, supplies, and funding um, were lacking. So as a result, um, in 1972, there were just 30,000 women participating in NCAA sports, as opposed to 170,000 men. 
So Title IX was designed to correct those imbalances by making sure they all had equal access um, to similar quality. Um, however, like many laws, this has evolved over time to include all educational programs that receive federal funding and to all aspects of a school's education system, um, such as interpersonal um, and sexual violence prevention, since it is considered a form of sex and gender discrimination. I'm going to attempt to get this to start because it's been giving me trouble, so I apologize in advance. So Take Back the Night is the earliest worldwide movement um, to stand against sexual violence, especially violence against women. Take Back the Night events um, began in 1960s in Belgium and England with protests about women not feeling safe um, walking down the street alone at night. So in 1973, um, a group of women at the University of Southern Florida dressed in black sheets, held broomsticks, and marched through campus demanding a woman's center. This video is not necessarily um, from that one. This is just one of the earlier Take Back the Nights. Um, and in Philadelphia in 1975, they held a Take Back the Night event to protest the murder of a microbiologist walking home after work. And in the 1970s, San Francisco had a number of rallies to protest snuff pornography and violence against women. These early protests sparked hundreds of events on college campuses and in communities of all sizes and locations, all hoping to bring awareness to sexual violence and provide support for victims. More and more communities have since joined the movement around the world to hold events related to their goals of support and awareness. I wanted to bring attention to this event because we actually held our own last night. It was done virtually, so it looked a lot different than what we're seeing on the screen right now, but it was still just as powerful. I can't help the ads, sorry guys. So the Violence Against Women's Act um, was the first comprehensive federal legislature legislative package designed to end violence against women. It was signed into law by former President Bill Clinton in 1994 and was actually sponsored by then Senator and now President Joe Biden. It was lobbied hard by women's group to persuade Congress to legislate federal protections. VAWA put into place multiple protections, including administering grants and programs to state and local governments. These funds are used to prevent and address domestic violence, child abuse, and also training victim advocates. It also funds shelters, rape prevention and education, and many other programs. It mandates that the government fund studies for violence against women, and it requires recognition of orders of protection across state lines. So before this was enacted, if a victim received a restraining order in one state and then moved to another, it was not guaranteed that the protection would be um, honored in the new state. So essentially her abuser um, could follow her across state lines and not be punished. So VAWA has been reauthorized multiple times in 2000, 2005, and 2013. So based on the precedence of the time periods, um, it is fairly bipartisan. And in 2013, in the 2013 reauthorization, it was expanded to include Indigenous Americans, same-sex couples, um, it increased protections for victims of sex trafficking, and it also added in gender neutrality. It lapsed in 2018. It was voted on in the House and passed in 2019, but unfortunately it died in the Senate. Um, but it recently did pass again in the House um, about a month ago, maybe and it will hopefully be addressed in the Senate soon. So for those of you who don't know, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month and changes like VAWA demonstrated that national efforts promoting sexual violence prevention were needed. So even before, I'm gonna call it SAM by the way. Um, so before SAM was first nationally observed in 2001, Advocates had been holding events, marches, and observances related to sexual violence during the month of April. And so the National Sexual Violence Resource Center was launched in 2000, and it began coordinating like the official logo and color and month for sexual assault awareness activities. 
Um, they play a major role in SAM since funding and time can be a barriers to communities and college campuses. Um, so they speak with constituents about the needs and they use that information to come up with each year's theme and event ideas as well as distributing materials. So even if a campus or a community has no budget whatsoever, these are free materials for them to be able to use. So in, in the early 2000s, the primary goal of SAM was awareness, obviously. But by the mid 2000s, um, it, they had incorporated prevention more heavily, focusing on areas such as communities, workplaces, and college campuses. And these campaigns discuss ways that individuals and communities can stop sexual assault before it happens by changing behaviors and promoting respect. Um, this intervention is still going on today and is basically kind of the outline that we follow here even at the University of Memphis, um, focusing on like bystander intervention and changing attitudes. After the 2016 election, people across the country began organizing, fueled by their anger towards language directed towards women, the LGBTQ plus community, people of color, and general anti-science views. Uh, Teresa Shook is known as the founder of the Women's March. Um, however, there were multiple others involved. And on January 21st, 2017, hundreds of thousands of women, or uh, people of all walks of life marched. Um, the main march took place in Washington, D.C., but there were multiple sister marches in all 50 states in more than 30 countries. It's estimated that 4.1 million people marched in the U.S. that day, um, with the largest demonstration taking place in L.A. with around 750,000 demonstrators. This is said to be one of the biggest, if not the biggest, demonstration in U.S. history. The march itself didn't have a central focus. Um, most people had their own reasons for marching. It could have been um, reproductive rights, sexual assault, climate change. There's a myriad of stuff. Um, however, a big theme were the pink pussy hats um, in reference to Trump's language in a leaked 2005 audio. You can see a lot here in the pictures, just lots of pink. Um, and just a fun little personal anecdote is that um, this March in DC was the first time me and my partner, now fiance, took a trip, trip. Um, and we had been dating for about four months at the time. Um, so that was our first out of town experience together. After the march, um, the Women's March became like an actual organization. Uh, there was criticism that some of the founding members expressed anti-Semitic and anti-LGBTQ plus uh, sentiments. But from what I understand, this has since been rectified and their board is incredibly inclusive with all different walks of life being part of it. So their current mission is as follows. The mission of the Women's March is to harness the political power of a diverse women and their communities to create transformative social change. Women's March is a woman-led movement providing intersectional education on a diverse range of issues and creating entry points for new grassroots activists and organizers to engage in their local communities through trainings, outreach programs, and events. Women's March is committed to dismantling systems of oppression through nonviolent resistance and building inclusive structures guided by self-determination, dignity, and respect. Um, there are many issues that they work on, but the first one on their list is ending gendered violence. So the one we're probably most familiar with is the Me Too movement. Um, in 2006, Tarana Burke began the Me Too movement. So a lot longer ago than people realize. Um, Tarana is a longtime activist beginning as a young girl in the Bronx, starting initiatives around issues like racial discrimination, housing, housing inequalities, and economic justice. After hearing stories like her own uh, from survivors of sexual violence after she finished college, she realized that too many girls had no access to resources or little access. So Me Too was originally a grassroots campaign and the vision was to bring resources, support and pathways to healing from sexual assault. Um, in 2017, after Harvey Weinstein's multiple instances of sexual assault came forward, the hashtag went viral. 
the movement gained more and more recognition um, from people like Alyssa Milano and Terry Crews discussing like their own personal experiences. And they, uh, the Me Too movement now has multiple programs to be sources of healing, support, taking action, and they even have like different trainings and things like that. So the movement has made great strides in multiple areas. So since 2017, here's some of the following changes. Uh, California, New York, and New Jersey have enacted some type of legislation to ban non-disclosure agreements in cases of sexual assault. New York expanded its sexual harassment law to cover independent contractors and improve protection for domestic workers. So unless you were a um, contract employee of the, uh, the company, you weren't protected under the anti-harassment laws. The Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which was launched in 2018, aimed at helping survivors get legal representation, has helped over 3,600 people and raised over $24 million. Uh, restaurant workers are often forced to put up with harassment uh, for fear that they could, um, like it could, like putting a stop to it could result in the loss of a tip. So the movement to end tipped minimum wage is gaining steam. So seven states have already gotten rid of this um, and more cities and states are beginning to follow suit. Congress passed legislation for congressional employees um, that eliminate the mandatory three month waiting period for people to report uh, sexual harassment. And it also bars legislators from using taxpayer money to cover harassment settlements which I didn't know they did in the first place. So that made me kind of angry when I read about it. Um, and some survivors are getting financial restitution. So an example of this is Michigan State. Um, they created a $500 million settlement fund for the survivors of Larry Nassar, who was convicted of sexually abusing more than 100 athletes. And then finally, there has been a cultural shift. Um, more Americans are seeing how widespread sexual violence is and how it affects survivors. Uh, gender and power are being examined more and people are realizing how much these play a role in sexual harassment. So, Las Tesis Colectivo is an artistic group from Chile um, and they became known in 2019 for their development of the street performance, Un Violador en Tu Camino, which means a rapist in your path. It has become a worldwide mantra, and rather than me explaining it, I'm just gonna let you watch. seen this video probably 
20 times at least at this point. Um, and I still find it just extremely powerful time and time again. And I think it highlights the impact that art has on us. Um, I don't think people just realize like how much influence art and that raw vulnerability can really have um, on changing our culture. So what's going on now? Um, work is far from over. I wanted to highlight a few instances going on now that I feel like deserve our attention. And it is just the tip of the iceberg. Like there are a lot more than what I am discussing today. And one thing I want to mention is that again, I'm only going over issues of gender-based um, violence and sexual assault since that is what I'm talking about here. Um, there are many problematic issues going on in local and state governments across the country, especially with the passing of bills that discriminate against transgender youth, um, as well as things like voter suppression and gerrymandering. Social media has a tendency to promote sexual violence. Um, Nearly everyone uses it. I know my generation started with sites like LiveJournal and Zanga and MySpace, um, and it has since evolved into something more than connecting with family and friends. A hard truth is that some of these sites were created with bad intention. Um, for example, Facebook was created so that Mark Zuckerberg and his college roommates um, could rate his female classics, classes, uh, sorry, female classmates at Harvard. We've seen social media create divide and it allows people to be enclosed in a bubble with people of similar mindsets. Anytime a news article shows up on someone's timeline about sexual assault, anyone can see the public comments. You see things like she's lying. Um, she should have known not to walk around alone. This was a punishment for being gay. Um, if, a, if it's come out that a female identifying teacher um, assaulted a male identifying minor student, I see things like, oh, that had been my teacher, I would have loved it, you know, things like that. And these are all so problematic. And being able to see these things um, only adds fuel to the fire. And then on like a more um, micro level, you know, people are getting doxxed on social media, um, being harassed via their accounts, um, you know, lots of revenge porn going on and things like that. And this is awful. And the sites don't really do the best job of moderating it. Um, a very unfortunate instance is going on this week. Um, there's a supposed National Rape Day that has been spreading around on TikTok. Um, reportedly, a few videos came out from some um, guys talking about how sexual assault would be legal on April 24th. And since then, thousands um, have posted about how horrific this is and spreading safety tips and prevention strategies. And, you know, I really hope that this is just a disgusting excuse of like what they think is a joke. Um, but it has caused a lot of concern among our uh, female identifying population, including on college campuses. So these sites have got to do better about squashing this kind of stuff when it comes up and making sure that it really can't even be posted in the first place. Totally understand that freedom of speech is a pillar in our country, but that shouldn't mean freedom from consequences. MMIW stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. Honestly, um, I don't know if I like where I put it in this presentation because this has been going on since the colonizers came to America. Um, however, it has recently gained traction outside of the indigenous population and more people are becoming aware of it. And I know I just harped on social media, but honestly, it's because of social media that people know about it. Um, so since 2016, there have been over 5,700 MMIW um, with an estimated population of 6 million um, indigenous Americans in the United States. This is a staggering number. And again, this is only since 2016. This is a rate 10 times higher than other ethnicities and 84% of indigenous women have experienced violence in their lifetime. The majority of these murders are committed by um, non-native people on native owned land. And because of the lack of communication between state and local and tribal law enforcement, it's difficult to begin the investigation process. And it often doesn't even get reported or recorded by law enforcement. So in this first picture, we see red dresses and the red dress project is an installation um, art project based on the like aesthetic response to the issue. 
The project has been installed in public places throughout Canada and the United States, and it's a visual reminder of the number of women who are no longer with us. Through the installation, um, the artist, Jamie Black, she is hoping to draw attention to the gendered and uh, racialized nature of violent crimes against Aboriginal women and to evoke a presence through the marking of absence. The University of Memphis is currently collecting red dresses um, for Native Rights, um, an organization that celebrates, advocates, and educates on issues surrounding North American First Nations. And then finally, there are the detention centers at the border. There have been multiple reports of sexual abuse um, that have come forward. And um, this is as recent as this, as this month. You know, we've been seeing what's been going on for the last, you know, four to five years. Um, but it's not just in like the previous administration, it's going on now too. And no matter your opinion on immigration, I really hope that we can all agree that no one deserves to be sexually assaulted, especially in government funded um, buildings. So what can we do? So first, educate yourself. Look up the stats. Look up what community resources are available around you. Researchers, or sorry, research what survivors go through and how there are systemic issues that contribute to sexual violence. I went over a very brief history. There's a lot that I missed, I'm sure of it. Um, so that can be part of that is going through and seeing um, how these issues have persisted throughout time. Donate your time or money. Um, with more places beginning to open back up, volunteers are always needed. There are tons of organizations that will also gladly accept your money. And I don't want to tell you what charities to donate to because that is none of my business. Um, but I recommend as part of like that education portion to find out what is needed in specific populations and communities and find like a well vetted organization um, that gives the majority of their donations to the programs that they sponsor. Um, become an advocate. This can be official in terms of going through advocacy training or just combining like all of these tips together. Um, you'll. If you want to be a supporter to survivors, you need to prove yourself to be a trustworthy person. It has to be earned. And then call it out when you see it. When someone makes like an anti-joke about sexual assault, say something. If your problematic uncle is being creepy, confront it, you know, locker room talk, nip it in the bud. These little steps will help change our society for the better, little by little. And then in conclusion, I want to provide resources for anyone who may need them. I'm located in Memphis, but I know we have people on in other parts of the state. So I'm providing more general resources um, and they can actually help you locate local ones. So feel free to screenshot this if needed. We have the Nas National Sexual Assault Hotline. We have rain.org. Um, they are fantastic. Not only will you find resources, but you can get lost in that website with how much material they have on like how to support survivors, different statistics, um, things like that, and then just different programs going on. You can go to the Tennessee Coalition to end domestic and sexual violence's website. They have some resources there. And also um, the National Sexual Violence Resource Center. Um, they are similar to RAIN and that they have a lot of um, information on their website as well. Also, one last thing. One of the things that we have discussed in a meeting earlier this year is wanting to make sure that the communities around us have access and interest in these like monthly lunch and learns. So I have a very quick survey that I'm going to drop in the chat. Um, it would be great to get as many responsible responses as possible on this, um, especially if um, interpersonal violence is not something that you um, you know work in job wise or volunteer wise or anything like that. We want to make sure that these will be applicable to the community. It's fairly open ended. So if there is something that you would like to learn more about concerning interpersonal violence, <clears throat> you'll be able to write that in. So let me go on and put that in really quick. Make sure it's not being sent to only Chloe. Yeah. Um, so that's just a quick Google form. And last but not least, here are my sources. And I'm sorry, you can't read them. There were a lot. But that is all I have for today. Thank you all so much for listening to me talk about this stuff for the last 50 minutes. And I really hope that there was something here that you learned and can maybe take with you. Regina, that was amazing. Thank you.
I learned so much. Um, I'm disgusted. Um, I'm angry. Um, and then I'm hopeful because so much has changed, um, but there's still so much that needs to be done. And so I'm thankful that you're doing the work that you're doing. I'm thankful that most of the people in this room, um, you're here, so you're doing the work in your professional life or your personal life. You must have some interest if you're here. So I thank you for doing the work too. Um, and yes, please fill out that survey. Um, that's just for the uh, lunch and learns for future lunch and learns to kind of decide where we want to go, what um, channel we want to kind of move into or what would get more people involved that you think. So please fill out that survey if you don't mind. And do we have any questions? I know um, Dylan and I were talking in the chat about that TikTok trend. I had seen a friend had texted me a couple of weeks ago and asked me if I knew anything about it. And at that time I hadn't, but then I started seeing stuff about it this past week. Um, and just how even, even though it's, it's, I don't know if it was meant as a joke or if, what it started out as, but it's grown into something. And I think people are going to take advantage of it. Um, so you've got, Katie said, this is very informative, really makes me want to get involved more. And Kayla said, great presentation. You did do fabulously. Do we have any questions or other comments? I hope not, because if there's um, anything about history, I'm not like, this is what I know. <laughs> so. I did, Megan, I don't know if Megan is still in here or not, but we, we were talking about the, um, the, it's 46 states is still legal, child marriage is still legal in 46 states. Yep. That's bananas. Has there been any kind of like move to try to change that at all or any anything? Um, not that I saw. Um, from what I understand, it, this, these types of laws basically kind of protect certain religious groups um, that believe in child marriage. Okay. That's my understanding. I wasn't able to see anything about, I'm sure there are like small movements individually and things like that, but I couldn't, I didn't see anything nationally. I could absolutely be wrong on that. There might be um, some grassroots organizations that are trying to change those types of laws. Um, gotcha. Dylan, any tips to get Title IX coordinators on religious college campuses to take Title IX seriously? So anyone can request a training of sorts, and we encourage a lot of our registered student organizations um, and other organizations on campus to do those. Um, it's something that I personally could probably reach out about and see if that's something that they would be interested in. I know there are some organizations that require it on college campuses, um, but that doesn't include all of them. Gotcha. Okay. Um, I just, hey, Regina, hey. this is Tiffany. Um, that was a great presentation. I learned a lot as well. Um, I am not as depressed as I thought I would be after hearing it. <laughs> But I just wanted to respond to this, um, this question from Dylan about tips to get Title IX co coordinators on religious college campuses to take things seriously. So um, Dylan, I am, a, I am the Title IX coordinator for the University of Memphis. Um, and I've been the Title IX coordinator at two other institutions prior to the U of M. Um, and it always is helpful to um, that Title IX coordinators, as well as folks in leadership. So we're talking about, you know, the president, the provost, the um, vice president of student affairs are clear about the consequences if um, they do not comply with Title IX. And so uh, sort of focusing not only on the consequences, but also getting concerned students together to show that, um, that there is an interest, that, that their students are paying attention to what's going on and that their students are demanding because the institution is there to serve the students, demanding that people pay attention to those issues. And so I would say those three things, you know, I'm, I'm not, I certainly don't wanna encourage anybody to go out there and start, you know, um, start, uh, you know, doing anything destructive uh, necessarily, but certainly, um, you know, 
utilizing your First Amendment rights, um, speaking out, and uh, sharing those consequences uh, can often be very helpful. And a religious institution doesn't have to, it, it doesn't have to be about encouraging, you know, um, activity that that particular religion might find, you know, objectionable under their religious beliefs. It could simply be about prevention, really, and that's the, where we should be focusing a lot of our efforts on stopping things before they ever happen. Um, so prevention and making sure that their student body is taken care of. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I think I misread the question. I thought it was religious school organizations on our campus. So my bad, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Awesome. Do you have any more questions? All right. Well, if not, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you for learning with us. Regina, thank you so much for putting on this great presentation and doing all the research. And you know, that can be some of this information is really depressing and, and taxing. So thank you for putting it all together for us. Y'all have any questions afterwards, please feel free to reach out to me or reach out to Regina. Um, and that's it. You all have a great day. Thank you.